here, great. Otherwise, get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Carol Rashad, um, and this is my co-presenter, Kathy Dew, and we are the leads for the course and program delivery team, respectively. I'm a quality student, and I'm really pretty excited to be able to show you the first uh, public release that's coming out next month. So a brief overview of our presentation. I'm going to talk just uh, quickly about what is curriculum management to orient those of you who, who may not be familiar with it. Um, what is a course? Talk, look a little bit at what a course and then spend as much time demoing functioning code. So there are going to be three demos around course. One is proposing a course, modifying a course, and um, comparing the two versions, so the original and the modified version. And then um, because of the complexity of program, Kathy's going to spend a little bit more time talking about the setup of the logical model of program that we're using with quality students. So there'll be a little bit more um, information there. And then go into a demo of viewing an existing major and modifying an existing major. And then we're going to talk about a little bit of what is next and um, hopefully have some time for questions and answers. Yesterday, we sped through this, so there was time. So hopefully we'll, we'll keep that first pace. Okay, so what is curriculum management? Well, curriculum management is exactly what it sounds like. It's a module that allows institutions to manage their curricula. And when we speak of curricula, we're talking about specifically for quality student release, courses, programs, but really it can be configured to accommodate any more generic learning experience or what we call a learning unit. Um, when we talk about management of curricula, we're talking about doing things like creating, finding, modifying, retiring, grouping, um, and some of the things, some of the management functionality, specifically create, modify, and retire, are things you can either do through a proposal process, like I can propose to create a course, I can propose to modify a course, or they can be done through direct administrative screens, more your CRUD operations. So just be aware that what we're delivering in 1.1 is proposal-based processes for course in administrative screens for program. Um, okay, so this is the landing page for curriculum management, uh, and it's just to help orient you a little bit when we go into the application. So we've got uh, on the far right, proposal, so proposing a course, things that are highlighted is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time in the demo today. So we've got proposing a course, finding courses and programs, and that's how you, you find the course in order to modify it, that's the navigation that we have. On the right, recently viewed, things that you've recently viewed show up there, um, and some of the management tools. Unfortunately, we don't have time today to demo any of the management tools, course set management, and learning um, objective categories, but you will see pieces and parts of that in, in our demo. Um, so, that's it. All right, quickly, what is a course? Um, a course, we, we uh, adopt a pretty traditional um, definition of course for quality student. It's a learning experience that imparts education through a series of activities like lectures, labs, recitations, etc. It's usually over a well-defined period of time, in contrast to program, which can extend for years. Um, the, way, the way we have modeled a course in, in quality student is, despite that traditional definition, we hope we've provided for some flexibility. Uh, you think of course as the container. Within that container, we have formats, and, and within the formats, we have activities. So activities are the heart of where the learning actually takes place. That would be your lecture, your lab, a tutorial, a recitation, etc. You can um, define multiple activities per format, and you can define multiple formats per course. Um, some other main objects that are associated with course are the financials, uh, learning objectives, and requirements. And the things that are in teal are, are uh, functionality that we share across course and program, so it's reusable. There's also, I don't have on the slide, but we have commenting and supporting documentation. Um, you'll see that demoed, but those are also services that we share across course and program. Am I talking too slow this time? I think you're doing okay. All right, workflow. Um, I just want to put a big on here, see Dave Elia. <laughs> he can tell you everything you need to know. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about workflow because it's, it's, you know, we could spend an hour simply on how we've integrated Rice into Quali Student. Hopefully you saw Dave's presentation yesterday afternoon. Um, I will say that we, on the core side, because it is proposal-based, it does have workflow associated with it. 
we've leveraged Quali Enterprise Workflow, or Q, to do that. Um, it uses qualified role-based routing, where the roles are um, derived from our organization service. And Quali Student is shipping with two reference implementations of workflow, one for create a course and one for modify a course. And so essentially, you've got a proposer who submits it then to his department, curriculum committee, the division, college, academic senate, publication office, which is typically an office associated with the registrar. If there's, if there's no committee associated with any one of those nodes, then the, the proposal will just skip that node and, and continue routing. Um, for modify, the, the main difference between the create and modify, we've inserted the publication office between the department and the division nodes in order that someone can make a judgment as to whether the modification needs to go through the full reuse process or whether it can be considered a minor modification and be fast-tracked to completion. Um, that's all I'm going to say about workflow. So, preemptory. <laughs> okay, so three primary scenarios. Um, the first one is we're going to have a faculty member in the biology department proposing a new graduate course, Biology 500, and we're going to watch the proposal um, be completed, submitted, and eventually approved, and then show up in our learning catalog. Uh, the next scenario is modifying the existing course. So Fred is going to go in and he's going to change the subject code, and he's also going to add a prerequisite. And what that does, it allows me to demo a little bit of our rules and how we handle prerequisites. Um, and then we'll see the modification be approved through blanket approval process. And then finally, the last scenario is comparing the two versions, the original and the modification. All right, so let's go. Submission. 
Okay, let me pause right here and talk a little bit um, about, about commenting. So what I didn't show is that he had invited Fran, his colleague Fran, to take a look at the proposal. And we do this through, um, you can invite people ad hoc to view, comment, um, or edit the proposal. And then you can also assign them action requests, FYI, acknowledge, approve. Very similar to Rice, it's just we've leveraged that and brought that into chaos. So he, um, he asked his friend Fran to take a look at the proposal. She leaves a comment saying, looks great, my chair is committed um, to covering 25% of the cost of mounting the course. So now he's going to leave a comment back to her letting her know that he saw that and um, he'll make some changes based on that. So he says, great, I'll make the changes in the financial sections. I have ESP, I know what he's going to say. <laughs> Four years. Okay, and he submits his comments. So it's just basically highlighting you get a log of comments. So he goes to the financial sections and he's going to go down to where you can add revenue and expenditure organizations. These are the organizations that either get the money or give the money, depending. Um, we're looking at expend expenditure organizations, and you can add multiple and allocate the percentages across those organizations. So he's in the biology department. He's saying, okay, we're going to take some of it. We're going to provide some of the expenditures as it's biochemistry, but ah, they have to add up to 100%. This is an example of our custom validator. Um, so he gets an error message that the percentages have to add up to 100%, and so he does that. Save and continue. There you can see where Fran was added. And now he's ready to submit to workflow. Gets prompted whether he wants to submit to workflow. And then just notice on the upper left hand, the only now the only action that, that uh, Fred can take on the proposal is to withdraw it. Once it's submitted, the only thing he can do as the initiator is withdraw. Then he's going to go take a look at the um, route log for this proposal to make sure it's routing appropriately. And again, this is just sort of demoing how we've embedded uh, Q and RICE functionality within chaos. Okay, so um, what happens next through magic? <laughs> rather than, at this point, the proposal's in workflow and it's going to step through each of those nodes and rather than show you me logging out and logging in as each node approver, um, we're at the final node which is the publication office. So the assumption is here that the proposal's been approved at each of the nodes, um, and now we're at the final node, so the publication office is taking a look at the proposal and deciding whether to give final approval. Upon final approval, the course will show as approved. So um, the pub office logs in, they say they have a proposal in their action list, and really the thing to get out of this is to see um, how we're logging decision and decision rationale even within chaos. Of course you can also use the route log for specifics, but here, so, I, mean, I don't know if, if everybody caught that, but we back up just a little, we did. Okay, so the proposal is lo loading. And hit the decision tabs and that's just to get a quick look at what, what the decisions were and what comments the approvers made when they made those decisions. So the, very, the one that's highlighted right now, and, and again, this is just to sort of flex a little bit of our functionality, or show a little bit of our functionality. One of the things we've implemented is return to previous node. So rather than just approve or disprove, we can have reviewers say, yeah, it needs a little minor modification, you know, send it back. And so in this example, Earl, which is the department chair, sent the proposal back to Fred and said, you know, please categorize the learning objectives. And categorize the learning objectives. Kathy will, will show you how to do that later. So this just kind of gives a, it, it's not meant, in, in some ways it duplicates the route log, but it also gives a quick, easy way from within the proposal to see what decision was made, who made it specifically, and what rationale is associated with that. So pub office is happy with it, and so um, goes ahead and, and does final approval. So approve for offering. So now proposal was approved. Okay. So now, um, now uh, they're just going to go. Now that the proposal is approved, um, it should.
should show as approved, so it should show up in our catalog of, of learning activities or courses, specifically. So we went to find course, type in the course code, and voila, there's our course with the stain of approved. Um, if you select that course, you'll get tossed into view course, and there's three different views associated with each approved course or active course. An at-a-glance view, which is just sort of the key information, the detail view, which will have all the specifics, and then a catalog view, so you know how it's going to look in the catalog. All right, so that's the first demo. Um, the next thing we're going to look at, sorry, I'm referring to my notes, we're going to look at uh, modifying this course. We're going to take this course and we're going to modify it. And the things that I want, um, the things that I really like for you to take away from this particular demo um, are how we navigate to modify a course. So we'll and this is a UX determined experience that the, the preferred pathway is to go find the course and then modify from there. We'll see a side-by-side -side comparison of the original course and then the proposed modifications. Um, so that's another feature I want to highlight. And then finally, um, we're going to look at adding a prerequisite. So we'll talk a little bit there about both our rules system. And we'll also employ a course set, and not just a course set, but a dynamic course set. There's lots of good stuff in this demo. Okay. So Fred's going to go find the course that he wants to modify. Again, he knows the, um, the course number, 500. Okay, so at the top under the, uh, there's a drop down. And right now the only action that one could take on this course is to propose a modification to it. So similar to a create a course proposal, you get thrown onto the modify section. And so again, on the left are, are going to be the proposed changes. On the right is the original value of all those data. And anything that's different will be highlighted. So the changes that he's going to make is he's going to change the subject code for biology to bio biological sciences. And then he has to add a rationale for why he's proposing that change. So let me just say a, a quick word about requirements. So all the, all the what we call requirements here, specifically course requisites, we handle via rules. So these are things like um, prerequisites, co-requisites, recommended preparation, which are not enforced. They're just recommended. Um, you also can have courses that restrict credit, and um, you can put a restriction on the number of times a course is repeatable. So the rule we're going to add here, it's a graduate course. So let me step back and do a little, uh, little business scenario. So the rule we're going to add here, it's a graduate course. It's, it's a um, now biological science is 500. And originally, when he originally proposed the course, he didn't have any prerequisites on it. And then he decided, you know, I probably want these students to take at least one 300 or 400 level course from our biological sciences program, just for a little bit of level setting. Okay, so the, the prerequisite he's going to add in and he decides, I don't really care what 300 or 400 level course, just a 300 or 400 level course. So this we're going to do via what we call a dynamic course set. So he's going to pick, must have completed n, cor n courses from a course range. So what that allows him to do is go in and define the course range of 300 to 400 and limit it to a particular subject code and then add the course range. And then he can say, well, how many of these courses do I want them to take? And he says, ah, just one. And you see, when he adds the rule, it automatically, we get the natural language um, translation of that rule. So basically, the value of this, this is A, just to demo our, our rules, <coughs> two, to, to demo course set, and three, to demo more specifically dynamic course sets. So the value here is, Say another, say one of these courses gets deleted from the curriculum or retired from the curriculum, or say a new <coughs> gets added. He doesn't have to go in and change his course set. And anything that's added or deleted will automatically be updated in this prereq rule. You also can absolutely go in and enumerate specific courses. So it all depends on the rule that you want to set up. So he's going to, um, so he sees he's happy with the rule and then um, goes back to the I'm going to pause here for a minute too and just note, I don't actually demo this, but see each of the courses now is it's a link 
So you can click there and it'll take you to the view of that course. So if you need to, you know, if it's just a handful of courses and, and the person wants to verify that they've chosen the right courses or the course has the content that they were thinking, they could do that here within the proposal. Okay, I'm excited. Again, try to navigate off, get the warning, any assumption changes. And now, again, you can see the highlight between um, the old and the new. I think I have to scroll a little bit over so you can see all that. Hopefully you're not too dizzy. And there's our, our um, The last thing I want to highlight on this particular demo is the, is the what we're calling the minor modification workflow or the blanket approve. So because this course has yet to be offered, um, it's not going to have any implications for students. It hasn't even been published in the catalog yet. That's our presumption here. So the pub office is like, yeah, okay, you want to add a prereq and change the course code. I don't, I don't care. No impact. So now, um, so the first node that We've inserted that pub office node, so someone can come in now. It is definitely a human being making this decision. Someone comes in, takes a look at the modification that's being proposed, and decides whether it needs to go through the full review process or not. Again, landing on the proposal summary gives a nice sort of quick highlight of what's changed to allow that assessment to be made. And one of the options then is blanket approve. And pub office says, yeah, I discussed these changes with Fred. Not a big deal, going to blanket approve it. And that way that decision is logged. And if anybody has questions as to why this modification didn't go through the full approval process, um, it's logged there. Consider a minor modification. Confirm. And now again, we can go up and look in our decision tab and just see that that decision is reflected. Okay, so now that that has been blanket approved, um, the course, the modification now should show up in our in our in our uh, catalog. So this final demo, yes, it's the final one. <laughs> Get ready. Uh, is now we're going to go in and we're going to take a look at the two versions. We're going to look at the, we're going to compare the original version of the course and the modified version. So again, we're going to go select the course that we want. And take a look at the version history of the course. So we'll see that there are, there are two versions now. Uh, one has been, the first one has been uh, closed, if you will, by putting an end date on it. And if there's ever more than one version of a course, you can compare any two versions. And it looks very similar to the proposal process. But again, the highlight, you can highlight the difference between the two courses. So you can quickly assess what changed. And if there's ten versions of a course, you can compare any two. Two and nine, one and ten. Um, so that's really kind of all I'm going to have time to demo today. I'm going to hand it over to uh, maybe I'll pause it. Yeah, we're such a small group. Are there any burning questions around course um, before we move into talking about program? Or they don't even have to be burning questions. They can be wildly <laughs> interesting questions. Like, yes. What happens if another 300 course becomes offered? Does that automatically become part of the Yep. Yes. started working on programs about in about June, I think, and in addition to building out the application, it also included developing the business service. So one of the first questions we had to ask ourselves is, what is a program? Um, this list is not complete by any means, but it is many of the things that we started to consider in the language of what do we consider a program. It was pretty easy to get sort of pulled into thinking about, you know, a Bachelor of Mathematics with a minor in science, you know, sort of the degree from a student's perspective. But we really didn't want to do that. We really wanted to back up and say, from a curriculum administrator standpoint, I want to be able to look at programs across all students, not for a specific student. So that's the approach that we took in this. 
Um, in terms of design objectives, uh, we wanted to capture data in a structured enough fashion to meet a number of objectives. Again, to allow a curriculum administrator to sort of look across the whole population of courses in some kind of um, equal way. To capture the way courses are related to programs, as you know, most many programs, most programs, it's not a regiment and set of courses. It's some set of courses or subset or variation. Um, we wanted to be able to feed a published catalog on the one side, which actually um, encouraged us to look a lot at the way rules were displayed, for instance, which ended up in some of the, the vertical display that you see in course as well. Um, and but also to feed a degree audit on the other side. Degree audit is typically where uh, most institutions, the place they have structured data. And it's usually not all of their programs, it's some subset of them. So I know at um, Berkeley we have um, a pretty good um, representation of undergraduate majors, but not really minors, not graduates. So um, we wanted to be able to capture the entire uh, catalog. Finally, we wanted to be able to enable curriculum managers to really understand the dependencies between courses and programs. And then last, it, this is starting to provide the basis for program exploration as we move into enrollment from either a student perspective or um, an advisor perspective. So we couldn't start with everything, so we picked the undergraduate major. It provided a lot of um, fodder of material for us to look at. So we started by looking at the baccalaureate level. So regardless of what major you're in, there are a number of rules and information that applies to the baccalaureate across the board. Then we get into the major, which is the main, the main um, area of uh, subject matter. And within majors, there could be specializations. Those could be formal in that one is required, or it could just be a, an area, a track, or a pathway of recommended study. Um, the next component of the undergraduate degree is the general <coughs> education program, or core, as, as Marilyn refers to it. I should pause for a second and say that in developing um, the, the program module for Kuali student, we knew that Maryland had already committed kind of up front to being the first uh, implementer. And so while we still considered and looked at our broad perspective of founding institutions that are part of the, the consortium of quality student, we were able to really focus a lot on Maryland. And that really helped the development um, speed, I would say, by being able to have access to the right people and make some pretty, pretty um, focused decisions. Um, and then to round it out, we also looked at departmental honors programs and minors. And then, of course, we really had to dig in with, into our requirements. So in looking at um, requirements, requirements are a little bit different. In the course world, we were relating rules directly to the course. When we got to the program world, it turned out that we really needed to be able to chunk up those rules into what the business world even calls requirements. As you're going setting up a, a program or a degree program, there are a number of requirements that you have to get into the program, to stay in the program, to complete the program. So those were our main categories that we started. Again, as with all things Kuali, this is configurable. You could add additional categorizations of requirements if you want, but this was a good place to start. <coughs> so in designing and developing or coming up with a, a logical model, um, the baccalaureate really represented, it was our, our example of or our type of credential program. Um, next is the general ed of the core. The major is, um, is generalized to be a discipline. Um, major is a common term in undergraduate, but in graduate they may or may not, and this is everybody's different, some people call them majors, some people don't, but there's still a focused area of discipline study. Um, and then specializations within that, and then minor and departmental honors. Then as Carol pointed out, we have a whole bunch of courses over there. So we needed the ways to really connect this. So that's what the program rules are doing. So there are no hard links between courses and program. It's all done vis-a-vis -vis these program requirements, which is a um, rules mechanism to do that association, to describe the association. Finally, we discovered in programs that we also needed to be able to make rules that refer to other programs. For instance, in the baccalaureate, we need to say you have to take a major in the undergraduate. You have to complete the general ed. So we needed to include programs in the profile of rule types that we have. Finally, there were other student attributes that started to make a big difference in program as well. So we have actually started looking at things like GPA, standing, etc. So in terms of some of the additional kinds of rules, we needed to look at the number of credits for the program, completing programs, um, minimum GPAs, not only for a, a particular course, but also for a set of courses or a time period or a cumulative one. Um, we also needed to establish some rule patterns that allowed us to look at 
an action like being admitted to the program with reference to some time, like either your admission into how many semesters you had been at the um, institution or how long you had been in the program. So quickly, what we did is we um, have spent a lot of time with the biological sciences program at Maryland. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a great example because biological sciences has six different specializations. So similar to what course did, we took the information about a program and chunked it into sections. So there's key program information, they're managing bodies, the requirements that we talked about, learning objectives, and then supporting documents. Um, the, the program requirements expand into these different types of requirements that finally reference rules. And then, of course, within biological sciences, you have all those specializations. Each one of those specializations has all of this associated with the two. So our program is a much um, bigger <laughs> object, obviously, than, than uh, what a course is. So now we're going to um, go ahead and go into the um, demo. And uh, I'm just going to actually just jump. So, same second cursor option. Um, we're going to go right into finding majors, uh, programs, major discipline. In this case, I'm, I'm going to show that I know the code, it's um, BSCI, so I'm going to go ahead and type that in and get a direct hit. Again, similar you know, screen, so there's orientation and commonness in the UI across the course and program. That didn't happen by accident. <laughs> so, when you first go into the program, um, right off the bat at the top, there's a sort of big at a glance. And in there is the key information that's really critical when you're first looking at the program. So what's the code, the level, what kind of credential program it is, it's a major, what degree types are associated with this particular um, major, um, some critical start dates, some titles, and then other information like SIP codes, um, what institution it is, and whether there's an accreditation associated, um, associated with it. Sorry. Um, on the left, you'll see this, this key, pro I'm going to pause for just a second. So over on the left are the different sections that we talked about. When you go in, you have to hit pause. Um, you default immediately into the UL sections. Beneath that, over on the left, there's a little history section where you see the version, and then you also see the last program update date, but you also see some information about the review of programs. While we haven't completely built out the tracking of that review process, we are capturing the last time it was reviewed and the next time it's expected to be reviewed. So looking at managing bodies, any of these can be multiples, because obviously with programs there are many interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary um, programs. In addition to the sort of curriculum oversight and student oversight, there's a deployment division, there are financial resources, and then financial oversight. Um, here are the specializations we talked about. You can see that each one of these is actually a, you know, a link. And so what you're seeing here is just a quick title and code of that specialization. And then we're going to go ahead and look briefly at general biology. And when you go into general biology, you'll see that basically you get a, the same footprint of what you just had. But up at the top, you know the parent program is biological sciences, and we're, we're in that specialization. Um, similar at a glance. We don't have any more specializations nested within the specialization, thank goodness. <laughs> so description catalog and catalog information, um, there were some additional things that we noticed right off the bat in the, in the catalog, like the ability to include core faculty members. Um, we both within course and program are working on the, the initials, um, um, leverage point or interface point to a catalog, so we started working with, with targets, what, what publication, what catalog is this going to go into, and then also some durations of this. And then finally there's some more info, which you might put something like a departmental website. Um, we're going to skip program requirements for just a second, because they're big, and we'll go look at uh, learning objectives. Learning objectives, um, again, this is a tool that's shared in course and program, and it's really a, an outline builder, if you will. So you can have nested objectives. Um, you can, I should pause. You can um, have any number of those learning objectives. Um, right now, learning objectives are defined specifically for the course or program. But what, what happens then is each one of those learning objectives can get tagged with a category. Categories, categories are managed across the board. So it starts giving you a way to have a taxonomy about your learning objectives as you're sort of moving into that kind of structured way of um, dealing with learning. 
So, I guess we're going into program requirements. Okay, so in the program requirement, the first thing you'll notice is there's sort of this, this box around here. The, the, um, the way the UI plays out in support of the structure underneath is that there is a program requirement sort of container for all of the rules that comprise that. Each one of those containers has a title, an expected credit range, and a description. And then you'll see the particular rules in there. So that describes a little bit of the structure. And then you'll see that there's some of these rules. This rule in particular was you must be admitted to the program before earning 70 credits. The next thing we get into is as an, an entrance requirement, at Maryland, unless you're admitted to the major as an incoming freshman, you're considered a transfer student. So whether you're an internal transfer student or an external transfer student, there are a number of different courses that you're going to have to um, take. And so um, this is, again, where you see some of the benefit of the description of what that particular program requirement is, and then the specific rules that make it up. I will say that there's one rule we, that I think is actually working in depth, but I wasn't able to get into the demo for today, where you can also take a test score result as um, as fulfilling a particular requirement. So, for instance, an AP in biology score of, I don't know, what's the score? Five. Five, yeah, it would also meet that requirement. So there's still a number of rule types that we're working on. This is also something that as an institution, you can add additional rule types. When we get into satisfactory progress, as I said, if you're a directly admitted freshman, you're going to have a lot of requirements that look like admission requirements if you were a transfer student. So that's what we're seeing. All of these, similar to what um, Carol was saying, you'll notice that you can actually click on the course to go see the course. So finally, we start getting down into, um, I think, some of the meat of this, where you get into, um, you know, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, overall satisfactory progress. So there are a couple of things we put in here. Remember how I said we have to reference things other than courses? So for instance, you have to have an earned cumulative GPA of 2.5. Um, and you must not exceed six semesters before completing the program. I don't think anyone would actually enforce that at a university, but just in case. Um, finally, we get down to the completion requirements. Um, this is one that um, isn't actually applicable to this particular major, but Maryland does have a rule with some of their programs that you can only have, you, can, you can't have more than three minors, which we can do it. Um, basic program requirements are listed, and then actually that's one of the rules we're going to go modify. Then we're going to go down and um, get to some of the supporting um, courses, which is where you get into some of the, the um, hardcore details of the program. And one of the rules is um, a bunch of um, chemistry, organic chemistry that you have to take. And there are really two ways you can do that. What I'm, what, the first way is just to list the courses. The second, which is really a third way that we create course sets in Kuali, is to have what's called a named course set. So rather than listing the courses directly in the rule, I could have outside of the system, in, in our manage, manage courses section, created a, cor a course set, it's actually down here at the bottom, which I'm sure I'll point to with the big cursor in a second, chemistry for biology. So that's a named course set. That course set can be managed outside of the rule. The benefit there, similar to the course ranges, is as that whatever defines what's eligible to be in that course set doesn't have to be, the rule wouldn't have to be touched every time that happens. And I, I went right past it, but there's also a hide and show courses. So there's another thing that's happening from a UI perspective that lets you either expose the contents of that course list, which, as you know, when you're in something like your gen ed program, there may be a hundred courses that fulfill a certain, you know, requirement. And so being able to hide and show that course set and manage it as a named course set is going to be beneficial. How are we doing? Questions? Stunned? Excited? Happy? Impressed? Um, we did a little bit different um, search here. I just searched on BI. In, in programs, we bumped into another thing, which was the specializations, while they're separate entities, are really part of that major. And so when you do a, a name search or, a, or even a um, code search, we need to be able to really go across both the, the major and the specialization. We couldn't just ignore the specialization. So that's what we're seeing here. Did it <laughs> Program action menu, we're going to go into modify, um, and we're going to go right.
right into the program requirements, and we're going to see. We're going to go down to one of the rules that um, it's basically just a general rule where there are a set of courses and you have to take one of them, and we're going to add a course to that. And as, as Carol mentioned, um, I, I don't know how many of you saw the demo last year. Um, but the, the whole rules environment has gotten a really nice um, renovation in terms of a, of the, a facelift for it. Um, we've got a pretty good, what, what, so once you select that rule, what happens is you can hit edit and it populates your, basically your rule builder with whatever that specific rule is. From there, I can go ahead and add any number of things. I'm going to add an approved course. From here, I can do an advanced search. If I don't remember what the course name is, which I don't. I can find whatever course it is, which I think I took Intro to Bio something. Oh, there it is. Biometrics, yes. Intro to Biometrics. This is why I didn't take any kind of science. <laughs> I can update the rule, and there's the, the new piece. I can hit Save, and then we can scroll down and see that that, that new course is in there. Is there a, is there a session on we should have done that. I didn't think of that. So there's the, the, new, uh, the new one. The last thing we're going to do real briefly um, is look at uh, learning objectives. In this case, I just did a blank search where it's going to just bring up everything in the system. Luckily, biology, biological sciences begins with a B, so it's near the top. Um, there, is, there are a little bit of navigation differences between the way a proposal wraps a, an object like a course and, and we are in, in uh, program. In program, you can just basically click around and go where you want. There's not an, an assumed flow, which is what happens when you're in a proposal process. On any section that you're in, you can go right into the modify. And from here, you'll see that the, this is where the learning objectives are, and then over on the right are where the categories are. And these categories are the way that an institution can start codifying some of those learning you know, results, learning objectives, learning um, outcomes, I guess is the other big thing. So I'm going to add a new one, which I did a copy-paste, so I didn't have to watch them type. And if I was, uh, then I want to add a category of biological. It has the um, type ahead. I see the biological evolutionary theories is not in there, so I can actually add it on the fly. Being able to manage those categories, if this makes sense for your institution, great. If it doesn't, you could also have that those categories couldn't be added on the fly. So you could have them as a more managed resource. This is, um, if you want to um, search the listing of categories, we have, you can search by name, you can filter by type. Again, types are all configurable. Um, but as we have worked across our consortium of institutions, really using learning objectives in a very strong way is, is pretty new. And, and it happens more in programs than in courses in a structured fashion, because a lot of that is required for the reviews and some of the accreditation. Um, but it feels like it's something that we need to help, help our, our family of institutions have a way to ease into. And so the, the balance between unstructured and structured, or defined per course or per program versus the codification of it, is uh, what we're trying to balance here. So we have a few acknowledgments. Yeah. And I think they're all in the room. So <laughs> if you're in the room, please stand. <laughs> I'm Karsty, Lita, Lisa! Um, on the program team, I, I want to acknowledge my dev lead, oh, Jim Sorry, I just spelled Delta there. I see that. Delat. You're from Delat. We're recording this, though. So. Oh, oops. I, um, I want to acknowledge Jim Tomlinson, who's my dev lead, and then also Dan Simons, who um, has uh, been invaluable in really helping shepherd us through this process. And he'll be here later today, right? Yes. Looking around yes. So what's next? As we mentioned, we've got a public release coming in mid-December. You know, stand by to download the code and have fun. Um, there are two implementing institutions. Uh, Maryland is, is committed to doing course followed by programs starting in January. Um, UC Berkeley, always on the cutting edge, um, actually went with an early release and they're exercising the business services with custom UI in their implementation of course. Um, 
There are a number of gaps, as you might imagine. You know, you don't ever get everything you can envision. And so one of the processes we're in, actually this week while we're here in uh, beautiful San Diego, is um, looking at the, the list of gaps compared with Maryland's um, priorities so that we can start to figure out how some of those institution contributions can come back to, into the quality um, core product. And now, if there are any questions, I know it's a huge group, and half of you have seen it. <laughs> yes? Um, a couple of questions. One of them is in regards to the rules. Um, those are a lot prettier. A lot more people. Yeah. Uh, but the, I was wondering how you would handle cases where there's a, a requirement for a particular type of course, mm -hmm. or a particular course, that can be repeated if they didn't achieve the, um, you know, the required grade in the first time around. Um, do you, does the current construct handle the concept of the most recent take or the highest grade of the take? That's, that's a, a really, really good question. Um, the, the short answer is no, but I think there's kind of a couple of things going in there. One, the issue of repeatability as an option is something that's captured on course. So that, that's, that's part, first of all, is the course even repeatable? The issue that you're talking about, about those thresholds for, or which one do you want, is a concept, frankly, that we, we just haven't gotten to. And yeah. we're right. kicking <coughs> Yeah, so the, the way we design it, once you have a rule type that specifies you must repeat this course, how you execute and how you enforce that is really dependent on Segregating 
by credential program type, but I don't think so. Because, it, you know, and so maybe there might be one or two rules that are repeated, but in general, when you're talking about your undergraduate population, I think that's a, a certain set. And then you have your graduate student or, or whatever. So I think some of it is going to get answered that way. The financial aid ones are, yeah, that, that, we considered those and we're considering them in our team, but exactly where that's going to fall. I mean, we know it's an issue that has to be addressed, but that's really a very, a lot of those are really specific, like are you taking the appropriate number of courses this quarter, right? So, yeah. yeah. But, but it sounds like you have the key concept at least envisioned yeah. in terms of there are multiple types exactly. of programs, right. all of which might apply to all the right. student, the program, right. or whatever. There's, there's so many contexts that you have to cover, you have to cover financial aid, like you said, uh, visa status, and there's right. so many things that can get triggered from your enrollment. So you have to be really cognizant of the fact that there's external systems that are going to have to tie in and figure out what the current enrollment is and what that means as far as progress in any. But there could be, for instance, like NPS, Naval Postgraduate Institute, um, which is a very uh, homogenous sort of group of students, they may have roles at the institutional level. Right. But, you know, like everybody in, in this institution needs to be doing these things, and, and so there's no reason why you can't make a institution program and embed rules at that level and then, and then nest your, your program, your, you know, your more academic disciplines off that. Again, knowing how different we are, even within the consortium, <laughs> provide a lot of opportunity for creative thinking. I think thinking codifying the rule. I think that the primary challenge for institutions will be codifying all their quote unquote rules. Good questions. Other questions? I give you back these five minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>